Welcome to this Mastering the Machine video from the Automation Academy for December 17th, 2022. The topic today was a course that I have created for Beckoff uh, training that I will be presenting next week and this covered a little bit of the creation of the course and what's in it. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Lots of attendees today. Thanks. This is an Automation Academy presentation of Mastering the Machine. I do these about every two to three weeks um, as part of the Automation Academy, which is my uh, online training uh, site. It's kind of a membership site, and I think a couple people here are members, and if you look around in that, uh, associated with that is IO Central. So you can see here the little IO Central uh, logo on the right. It's an attempt at a, uh, a kind of a social media site. <laughs> it's kind of funny because some people have uh, logged into it and then tried to message people and sent like spammy emails and things. And that's one of the downsides to creating a social media site. So uh, that didn't work very well. So I'm gonna have to rethink exactly how I do that. But I, I did open it up to the public and then some people got on there and did weird stuff sending people emails. So sorry about that for those of you who got any of those emails. In any case, um, Automation NTH, NTH University is somebody that kind of helps sponsor this. And that's uh, who I'm actually giving this uh, Beckoff course through. Uh, so I'll tell a little bit about that uh, as we get into the, the Beckoff training and, and how this came about. Uh, but that is the subject today is Beckoff training and a course that I've created for it. And I see Gary Pratt's on here now. Gary is an expert at codices type things, and Beckoff is similar to that. I do not claim to be an expert on Beckoff. As a matter of fact, uh, I've had a controller for about five years, but I, I uh, just really started learning it last spring. Uh, and then suddenly I have to actually create a course. So that's where this came from. Uh, get us some of this basic stuff out of the way. What is Mastering the Machine? This is a download. Um, it's a 26-page document I put out about 10 years ago, uh, and it's available for download at my websites, one of which is a blog, and the other is my company site where uh, the Automation Academy is hosted. And it's evolved into uh, this website, um, and you can join the Automation Academy if you are interested at the website pictured right there. Uh, but I just named this this webinar after Mastering the Machine because I thought it was a cool name and it's mostly about machine building and that sort of thing. What is the Automation Academy itself? Uh, I have a lot of training videos on there, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a library of training materials, technical documents, software, some of my books, uh, things like that. There is a community, IO Central, which as I mentioned, uh, I'm, I may need to rethink a little bit I see Phil Scruggs is out here and he got one of those emails. Uh, we had a couple people that got those and it was some lady trying to come on to people on the site. So I don't know why people do that, but anyway, they did. <laughs> so, uh, and we do have these regular events, Mastering the Machine webinars. So, uh, and you can, you can join up here or go take a look at it, see if it's something you're interested in. Uh, so, um, how did this come, come about? Uh, let's see. Actually, I didn't think this was the first page, but these are the trainers that I will be using. So I have several uh, back off trainings, but uh, trainers that I have built. But let me let me tell you a little bit how this came about. Um, there is an initiative at Automation NTH. Automation NTH is a I'll just show you a little picture of it. Uh, here's NTH University. Uh, this is actually the first slide of the the slide deck that I'm going to be using for the class. Automation NTH is an engineering company, and uh, I do work for them uh, ever since the tornado that happened a couple of years ago. I do about two weeks a month for them since a lot of my travel went away, and I've had a relationship with them for a long time. I teach two advanced PLC programming classes a year uh, for them, and I also teach some of their customers. We have uh, some generic classes. You see this little conveyor here. We run people through um, uh, PLC programming classes where they have to sort parts into bins and it's all timer based and it's kind of a tricky little project. And so people learn different platforms. You can see all of the different uh, trainers that they have back here. 
So as people do these classes, they learn, uh, you know, Modicon or GE or whatever. And last spring, uh, they started deciding to get heavily into back off. And one of the reasons is they do a lot of work for pharmaceutical companies and uh, pharmaceutical and medical device companies. And there seems to be quite a bit of back off in those plants. So uh, the president of the company decided to start an initiative and start learning about back off since really none of us knew much about it. Uh, so I had had a Beckhoff trainer for about five years. I put it on the uh, uh, big toy factory that I had in my old facility before the tornado, and it just sat there on the wall. I powered it up, but I really never did anything with it. As most of you know, I teach uh, Alan Bradley and Siemens extensively, but really just didn't know a lot about Beckhoff. But I knew even back in about 2017, it was going to be an important platform because basically it's a computer. Um, fundamentally, that's something I have to remind myself over and over again. It's it, You don't think of it as a PLC. You really need to think of it as a computer. And as you start getting into some of the hardware and the configuration and things, you'll find out that it's very different than configuring, for instance, an Allen Bradley PLC and communications and all that. You really need to think of it as a computer. But that's where uh, this class came from. So um, I'm going to show you the timeline. Let's see, I think I put this on here. Yeah, the, the original initiative was back in the spring. Uh, and that's when they said, some, you know, you guys need to start learning about back off. So they kind of gave me free reign to start writing uh, everything that I learned about back off. So I hooked up my CX9020 and I started, uh, you know, writing programs for it and learning about it. Um, and then I had a webinar in July. And the results of that webinar were very interesting. I don't know if uh, if Jacob Sagatowski is on here, but Jacob uh, was a guest on that, I believe, or he popped in for it. And I I usually get maybe a hundred views on a lot of my uh, you know webinars and things associated with this on YouTube. And Jacob uh, promoted it, and suddenly I had eighteen hundred views. Uh, so by far. That webinar back in July was the most attended webinar, most views on YouTube. So obviously people are into Beckhoff and him simply mentioning the fact that I had had the webinar, uh, you know, just made it take off. So I started getting even more excited about Beckhoff, right? And then suddenly um, Automation NTH, uh, you know, I contract to them, but I'm, I, I have a cubicle in there. I think Scott, Scott's on here. I see him. Uh, I work there in the uh, engineering area, and I'm there for about two weeks a month. And what they've done in the past is they've sent me leads for classes that come on the website. You know, they don't have time to follow them all up. And in a lot of cases, uh, I get onesie twosie customers out of it. Sometimes I'll get uh, a few people and they'll be in another place and I'll send them a quote for my training services, or I'll refer them to automation training, right? If it's a standard, they're just looking for Alan Bradley or Siemens, I'll refer them to automation training and I may end up teaching the class anyway. But this particular customer uh, was local and they referred the class to me and I talked to the folks there and they said, well, we have about three maintenance people and we wanna learn Alan Bradley and Siemens and Beckhoff. And I said, well, that's really hard to do in a week, <laughs> right? So they said, okay, well, we're going to concentrate on Beckoff. We have a lot of Beckoff equipment here. And that kind of surprised me because I didn't know there were a lot of customers here in this area that had a lot of Beckoff. Interestingly, uh, I had uh, done work for this customer back when they installed the plant. It was late 90s, and I put a little DVT vision system in there. Uh, so I was kind of familiar who, with who they were, but it turned out they were also an automation NTH customer. Uh, NTH had done a line for them. And so when I talked to them about it, uh, you know, they came back to me and said, you know, we have a relationship with automation NTH and we'd like to pass the PO through them. And I said, OK, I'll ask if they can do that. Uh, and they said, sure. As a matter of fact, we'd prefer that, you know, uh, if you have customers that are in this area that you pass it through us. So that's kind of how this, this came about. Um, so what did I do? I took my CX9020 and I built that into a trainer. And you, some of you may recognize these trainers. This is in the automation NTH lab here. Uh, but I built this. This used to be on the wall 
in my uh, training facility attached to uh, part of the toy factory. And some of you have seen that before, but I built this into this trainer uh, with these little push buttons. And I have a little toy stack light here and, you know, typical uh, power up and e-stop. These are pretty standard trainers that I build. And then uh, back a couple months ago, I bought another, a different C6015 uh, back off PLC here, and I built that into a trainer. And this is a little different. You can see the IO here is built right into the trainer, in this case on the 9020. And in this case, it is remote. Um, little story behind the uh, EK1100, which is this little remote IO. There are severe uh, supply chain problems getting a hold of these. So what these would typically look for, uh, look like would be, let's see here, it would look like, whoop. I have another thing here, let me show you that. They would look like, and I will go through this slide deck also. They would look like uh, it's inside of this. So typically what you would get if you bought a EK1100 is this, right? You would have a uh, regular old ethernet port, RJ45 port attached to the controller. And that's what we would prefer to use. That's what you'll probably see on most of your controllers. Well, supply chain uh, said that uh, back off when we tried to order this, they said, we're about 10,000 units behind. We can't get these. So I had to say, well, what do you have? I need to build some trainers like really fast. What do you have? And they said, we have these, right? So you can see here, these are M8 connections. And so, you, you know, I bought the ethernet cable from them and used it. It functions the same pretty much, but it is a little different, different layout here. So I was able to get these. Anyway, I built these trainers. Uh, Right here, you can see there the uh, EK1100 with the different plug into them. And uh, then frantically started trying to create material for this class. Uh, fortunately, since April, I had been learning about Beckoff and uh, of course did the webinar and Jacob showed up and some other folks uh, learned a lot about the hardware up until about July and then had been doing some programming with it and then got the request for this class. So to put this class together, all of a sudden I had to figure out what kind of a structure I was gonna put the class into. Um, what I did is some of you may know, I have a book, I have a couple books out. Um, this book, the original book here was published in 2016. And this is used by one of Automation NTH's customers to train their technicians. Uh, it is a generic PLC hardware and programming book. It's not really meant to be on anything specific. I put a little bit of Alan Bradley and a little bit of uh, Siemens in it. And uh, I think I referenced uh, Omron and, and uh, Mitsubishi and some other things and just really approached the instruction set, mostly in ladder. I did talk about the five, uh, I, you know, IEC 61131 languages, but I really mostly uh, did this for people that do a lot of Allen Bradley and, and Siemens and explain generally what PLCs do. Uh, back in February of 2022, we republished this so that we could get a hold of these books and get them to the customer because this was originally published through Author House and it was just really hard to get product. I had to buy it just like anybody else. I had to uh, pay full price for it or you had to order it online and people would carry onesie twosies. And if the customer wanted 10 of them, uh, it kind of caused problems. So we went ahead and kind of rebranded this with the NTH University logo on it and put it out. And so when I created the Beckoff uh, manual here, I basically just copied the front page of this, right? Which had the NTH University logo on it. And it said course manual and it says hardware and programming. It kind of matches up with this book. So I did not recover ladder logic or the instruction set at all in this, in this manual, but I am going to be showing you what the manual looks like inside and what the course is going to be about. So that's kind of where this, this little book came from. Um, I started working on this little book. So this will tell you how fast uh, 
how long it takes to create courses uh, at the end of November. But fortunately, I had already written a lot uh, for people inside of Automation MTH just to be able to connect up to the controller and, and what is the hardware. You know, did the hardware manual first and kind of explain what things are and then uh, started creating the course. So all this uh, really has been done since the end of November, beginning of December. And I worked on it just about exclusively since that point. Um, this again is the classroom. Here's a little view of what our setup looks like. You can see somebody sitting back here. I think he's an IT guy working on a different computer, but we are, this was set up as of yesterday, ready for the students to come in. There will be three students from this customer and then a fourth uh, NTH university uh, or NTH employee. Uh, she's a controls engineer uh, level one uh, that I've had previously in classes. She's going to be attending the class at least a couple of days. So she'll be back here kind of at this bench in the lab and she'll probably be working with this controller. So we have two of the two that I built here on the tables and then we have another controller here. And again, they are different. Um, different types of controllers. Uh, there is the 69020, there's a 6015, and then there is a CP6060, I believe it is. And it is an HMI type controller. And that's the one I kind of showed you before. So uh, this is the, uh, let's see, PowerPoint, uh, actual PowerPoint that I'll be using in the class. I don't do a lot of PowerPoints typically. Um, usually what I do is I, you know, I sit down with the book if I'm teaching an automation training class and everybody has a book and I show what I'm doing on my laptop. That's typically uh, how you would guide somebody through a class. You give them examples and uh, little exercises and they go through the exercises. And of course, the book's full of those. I have 17 exercises in this particular class and then they will accomplish whatever that is. I don't usually use a lot of PowerPoints, but I do think it's a good idea uh, because it kind of, people can look up at the screen or they can look down at their book or they can look at their laptop or whatever. So uh, like I said, this class kind of got absorbed into the automation uh, NTH, NTH University uh, platform. And we are having the students, they are maintenance guys from a local plant and they're coming in. And uh, so we're doing a little bit of, you know, self-promotion. They're going to show them what NTH University and Automation NTH is all about, um, go through some of these things and, you know, show them the building and all this. Uh, we advertise all these different courses. Somebody, right, at, at Automation NTH knows about all these different things. And one of our uh, supervisor uh, ladies put all this together, really made some nice slides. So I just appropriated those explaining what NTH University is. Here's some of the courses within NTH University. Uh, the 100 level courses are mostly for interns and apprentices. The 200 and 300 are for more advanced people. You can see here, there's like OEE and stuff like that. Lots of advanced vision, uh, vision techniques, things like that. And they do use my books, uh, which, is, which is nice. So they put this right on the front screen. That's a little bit about NTH University. Uh, the Beckoff course overview. This is, is basically some of the kind of uh, bullet points of the things we're going to cover. Uh, we've got a safety guy who's going to come in and talk about lockout, tagout, and NTH safety so that people don't electrocute themselves. We're only working with 24 volts. I don't think we have too much danger uh, going on there. I did have to put a, a relay in one of these uh, <laughs> In one of these trainers, it's kind of funny. You have to plug it in to use the push button box because the I.O. had to be switched. So this is the lockout, tagout, and safety screen that I'll be showing. And then I go through a lot of the hardware and uh, products that uh, Beckoff makes. And I did this in the July webinar. So those of you who see this on YouTube later, go back to the July 1st webinar, which is, as I mentioned, the one that has... Uh, you know, 1,800 views on it more than any other ones. And that's really mostly what I covered was hardware and, and uh, you know, a little bit on TwinCat and what the software was named. But at that time, I hadn't done a lot of programming, so I wasn't very comfortable explaining how the software worked. So I go through this first, and we talk about all the different products. Of course, show them the trainers. 
uh, and then introduce them to the Beckhoff information system. This is really, really important. I think you can find the answer to just about any question you would have in Beckhoff at this website, infosysbeckhoff.com. And you can drill down and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of documentation and information on the Beckhoff hardware and software. And I, I do some links in here and uh, point out where some of the different things are. So as we get to the different sections of the book, I will point to those and show people in the uh, Beckhoff information system where that information is kept. Uh, we do use the PLC hardware and programming book. So like I said, I didn't duplicate that in the training. So I explain what this is. They do have a copy of it. I talk about the history of PLCs. What are they? Explain digital and analog. I do not know what these guys will know. Uh, they are maintenance guys from three different shifts. And I've taught so many Alan Bradley and Siemens classes. And I get guys from the experts that know a whole lot to other guys that have almost never used a computer. So, uh, you know, explaining what digital and analog is, uh, how communications work, that's critical in back off. You really need to know your ethernet. Um, there's a lot of little tricks in there and configuring ports and uh, possibly setting up DHCP and knowing what addresses are. Then I go through data and data types, which will be, you know, your typical hex, BCD, decimal, binary, explaining what all that is, explaining how we can combine bits to make numbers and all the basic stuff that probably most of the people that watch this already know. Um, I do explain IEC 61131 dash three, which is the definition of uh, what a PLC is, how timers are supposed to work, how the data works, and the languages, right? There are five languages. And for those who, you know, we do a lot of Alan Bradley here in the United States, and we, we lean a lot on uh, ladder logic. But, uh, and, and Alan Bradley's honestly built around ladder logic, right? They have some powerful instructions, and it's very useful. But there are other languages, and depending on the platform you're using, like when I teach Siemens, I have to talk a lot of statement lists. That is an instruction list-based uh, programming. It's like assembly language, and it, a lot of people don't like it, but it's actually pretty powerful. You can build some neat stuff. And when you do high-level programming, um, high-level like C and Python and things like that, uh, declaring variables, using if-then-else statements, things like that. You are using structured text. And Beckoff is very heavily oriented towards using structured text. And a lot of their examples use that. So I have to cover that, but that's not in this book very much. I explain what the languages are, but a lot of the examples in this book are ladder logic. So we take the ladder out of this book, and I do some exercises in there. And then I explain what the trainers are. And show the three trainers that we have access to. Uh, these two are set to DHCP, and this one is set to a fixed address, the Beckhoff trainer. And so they're going to have to learn a decent amount about communications before even trying to attempt to these and set up a what's called a route, a route, uh, which is your communication setup. And they're going to have to know something about Ethernet. So we're going to have them set up all the communications and uh, log into the controller and find the I.O. and all that good stuff. So I show them what the controllers are. This is the actual PowerPoint I'll use, explaining what things are. Then go into the hardware and wiring. And uh, I actually have a broken uh, bus coupler <laughs> that was the old style. I bought this on eBay because of the supply chain issues. I couldn't get... Uh, any of the ones with the RJ45 ports on them. So I bought one and it came in DOA, it did not work. Uh, we took it apart and found what looked like spilled coffee inside of it. Uh, there are little brown marks and that, that's what it looks like happened to it, but it, it doesn't work. And there's a guy at Automation NTH that may try repairing it or drying it or whatever. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, it does light up for all of the I.O., but it does not light up the uh, actual little brain in it, right? So the uh, link actives light up, but the run light does not come on, and the LED up 24 and US 24, uh, US 24 doesn't light. So that is for the uh, user power, right? So you power the unit itself, 
the, these terminals, and then you power the I.O. through these terminals and they transfer down the bus. That's a little on the hardware. And then we get into TwinCat software. Um, and I talk a lot about installation. I learned a lot about, um, you know, lots of different details about the installation. If you already have Visual Studio running on your laptop and you install TwinCat software, it is going to install it over the top of it. And you have the opportunity to either use the shell that they have, or you can use whatever flavor of Visual Studio you have installed. And so I, I cover all that. We don't have a lot of time to go into great detail, but I do go into quite a bit of detail on installation. I've now had to install it on, I don't know, nine or 10 computers and then reinstall it and do lots of stuff. And I talk about licensing, uh, remote manager. Remote manager is kind of like having different firmware. For those of you that do Alan Bradley, you have to use the remote manager to use older firmware. So uh, I do set that up. As a matter of fact, the CX9020 that I showed you is an older platform. It's a uh, 4020 instead of 4024. So it's uh, you have to use Remote Manager to connect to it. Uh, one of the little things that's a little irritating is if you forget to switch your firmware platform to the version of your controller, you must shut down Visual Studio completely and restart it. Uh, there is no workaround. You can't just select it. Uh, if you open your project, you can't even close the project. You have to close all of Visual Studio and restart it and this time select the correct uh, brand. So there are things about Beckoff that are harder, more difficult uh, than typical PLC programming, right? There's a lot to it. One of the things, like I said, I keep reminding myself, this is not a PLC. It is a computer in every way. So things like configuring your, your ports, uh, communication ports. You don't do that through TwinCat. You do that like you would do a computer. You get in there and configure the ports that way. Uh, there's very little you can do to configure the ports within TwinCat software itself. Uh, you have to set up your routes and all that kind of stuff. So we go over communications a lot. Uh, then we create a new project, connect to the controllers, and scan the I.O. Uh, since I have three different controllers, they're going to pick up a lot of different kinds of I.O., and we're going to talk a lot about um, EtherCAT, right, which is um, a kind of a, it's not really proprietary, but it's pretty specific to back off and some motion control and things like that use it. So we're going to talk a lot about EtherCAT. Uh, and they're going to scan the I.O. in. And uh, then they're going to be working on their local uh, controller. I had to set computers up to where the software would run, it's not even an emulator, it actually runs a, a PLC on the laptop itself. One of the things we learned, uh, and this is going to be really important, we all of the company computers that we had at Automation NTH had security on them, right, company security and things like that. And one of the things they use in the company security is Hyper-V. And I think that's probably common in security applications, right, cybersecurity. If Hyper-V is running on your laptop, you cannot run the PLC. Uh, it will detect it. And I think it that Beckoff thinks that you're trying to bypass and run virtual things so that you can use the I.O. for free without a license. That's my guess as to why they do that. But if you are running Hyper-V or uh, any other VMware, right, uh, it will uh, not let you run the TwinCat software. So, and not let you run the, the PLC part of it anyway. You can't, um, you know, run like a simulation or something like that. So, uh, that was uh, kind of a tough thing to learn. And so, we couldn't use the NTH computers. And I had to make sure that all the computers that I put in there did not have Hyper-V running on them or any other VMware. Um, that's all disabled. So, I've been through a lot of battles with computers. Uh, I see Scott still on here. Scott can attest to that. I spent lots of times uh, messing with computers. Uh, we will be going through POUs. So for those of you that are used to routines and tasks and things like that, uh, function blocks, right? That's what POUs are, programming organization units. Not something that you hear of when you do Allen Bradley or Siemens or GE or something. You don't call them POUs. You would call them, you know, routines or uh, programs, things like that. But this is what they're called in Beckoff. 
Uh, so we use uh, programs rather than routines. They're about the same thing. Uh, functions and function blocks. With function blocks comes something complex, which is object-oriented programming. Uh, I see also Gary still on here. Gary could probably tell you hundreds of pages of information on object-oriented programming. That's what uh, most people that are doing code assist work and things like that are uh, uh, talking extensively about object-oriented programming. Uh, there we go. We got a chat up. Frank was putting his computer problems this week lightly. He had the keys to the struggle bus all week long. I like that. Uh, yeah, so um, I talk about methods and procedures, properties, inheritance. One of the problems with teaching uh, basic maintenance people is they are not going to understand most of this. Uh, and I don't really intend them to become programmers. And they even said that when they set this class up. They said, uh, we are you know, not expecting people to come out as experts on Beckoff, but we do want them to be able to troubleshoot things, recognize things, what are these things, right? And when you look in a, in a Beckoff program, you're going to see a whole lot of little um, you know, icons and things, and they're gonna say, this is a method, and this is a get, and this is a set. And you know, there's inheritance and uh, interfaces and lots of stuff. So I have to explain what all those things are. And I have built some function blocks that I will point them to and explain how these things are related, but I will not have them actually build one. Uh, they will import this stuff and then use it, but they'll at least know what it is. Uh, then I cover watches uh, and uh, Watches are basically, you know, watch tables. You would use these in uh, VAT tables in Siemens. Uh, that would be something you'd be familiar with. Uh, Visutes, this is something really cool. This was, I was really happy with this. Uh, Visutes are HMI screens and you can build your own little HMI screens for your own purpose. Uh, and use them to simulate things, right? And run your PLC and connect to things. So I have them do that. Uh, one reason is I like HMI classes, they're fun. Uh, usually when I teach HMI classes, people get to draw stuff and get very creative. So uh, we're gonna be doing that. We're gonna be creating uh, auto and manual mode and some auto cycle start, and then doing a little bit of data acquisition with it in structured text. So I explain what a lot of that is. I have them import things. And then I go through explaining libraries. And the reason I explain that is that I had a lot of trouble with. Um, when I built my CX9020 program, it used the older remote manager and I had tons of problems with the libraries. Um, I created some visualizations and tried to do some numeric entry and it did not work. As a matter of fact, it would cause hundreds of errors when I compiled. Uh, so I got with Beckoff Tech Support, which, by the way, I would uh, recommend highly. They're excellent. They're very helpful. You call them, they're in Minnesota, and they will help you out. But I sent them uh, multiple copies of my program, and they never did fix it. Um, they sent me back things that they said work at their location, but they did not work at my location. They would send them back, and they would compile and have errors. And they it had to do with the versions of the libraries that were in there. And so I learned how to go to the um, libraries and the different references and swap libraries out, import, export, uh, delete things. And it was a nightmare. And I don't think if I can't do it and some of the other folks at NTH, uh, Joe Caccini, smart guy, he couldn't fix it and they can't fix it at, uh, you know, at back off, I just think people are going to have a nightmare with that. So the best way to do it would be to simply, uh, you know, use the newest firmware and everything should work if you use the newest stuff. But when you go back and use remote manager, uh, you could have all kind of mismatched libraries. And fortunately, one thing I got out of it was I got every li library that the tech support guy had. He sent me a copy of every single version of every library he had so that I could swap things out myself. I never did get, and it was numeric entry only on my visualization. That was the problem. Uh, then we do troubleshooting. So the very end thing that we're gonna do at the end of class are general concepts of troubleshooting. Fortunately, uh, I have written, like I said, that other book, The Maintenance and Troubleshooting 
an industrial automation book and I had a lot on troubleshooting. So I incorporated that in the book. And then of course, cross-referencing, which most uh, technicians use to go trace uh, things through a program. That can be really tough again in, uh, in Beckhoff because you're having to trace through a lot of different types of routines. You may not understand what you're tracing through. You may have multiple instances of the same you know, function block. And so finding things can be tough. And then the last thing we go through, and I added this literally on the, almost the day that I had this book printed, uh, is scopes. <laughs> and I had not used the scopes there much, but they're basically an oscilloscope. Uh, it's like trending in Allen Bradley or Siemens, except it's a lot more elaborate. You can look at your signals, you can look at your motion control, and you can look at you know uh, just about any variable in your processor at a microsecond level and pick up uh, all kinds of data. So you build a scope basically to do that. So that's the, uh, and then this, this is interesting. I put this here at the end. Uh, this is how I created some of the graphics. Uh, Gary may have something to say about this because he just wrote a book that's several hundred pages long. Uh, graphics are a tough thing to do in books. And so what I do, I, I've kind of evolved through the years. I used to use Corel Draw and things like that. Now what I do is I build things. Uh, you can't really see them here. I build things uh, in PowerPoint, and then I do a, a large diagram like this, and I snip it. I use the snipping tool, and I turn it into a graphic and then embed the graphic in, in the book. So a little look at the book itself. Um, I'm going to drag this over here. This is the course manual. And uh, don't know if anybody can see my screen here or my, uh, my actual face here, but yes, I can see myself here, but now it's all blurry. It kind of changes the focus of everything. But anyway, this is the book, blurry, for those of you who could see it. Uh, so I just got that book printed um, Thursday night. And I, I frantically put this together. It's about 79 pages long. And as I mentioned, it is in addition to this book, right? Which is the original PLC hardware and programming multi-platform book, February. And you can see I copied the front page and changed it into Beckhoff. So that's where this came from. This is the book, uh, putting together course material, right? I always put a table of contents and let it update itself. Uh, you can see the structure of the class, talk about Beckhoff, the company overview, product areas, hardware, software, TwinCat 3, and then some exercises. And the exercises are simple. They ask questions about the hardware, about the licensing, and uh, pr pretty straightforward stuff. We only have four days for the entire class, all the hands-on part and everything. So the exercises, uh, some of them are just fill in the blank questions, and some of them are that you know, do something exercises like ladder logic, a uh, little bit of programming there. I started out, ladder is kind of my main language because I'm an Alan Bradley guy. I've been doing it for 30 years or so, and that's that's my go-to. So I started learning back off with that. And then uh, I also do teach structured text and other languages. So I quickly uh, transition into that because that's what most people are going to be using probably in back off, especially if they're young people, right? Young people uh, learn uh, high level languages in college and that's what they like to use. Uh, so uh, cover that quite a bit. Uh, so let's see, remote manager installation, EtherCAD, et cetera, terminals and wiring. You've seen most of this on the, on the uh, PowerPoints. So, what I do that the, the course is built around taking all those uh, stack lights and things that I have on the trainers and first just building a latching circuit with, uh, you know, a start stop circuit in ladder, uh, basically just latching some bits and setting things. There's the hardware listing all the different parts. I'll show you that part when we get to it. So this is what the book looks like. This is one reason I'm not sure I'm going to be able to ever publish this book because I did use a lot of pictures from Beckhoff. And uh, the only way I could ever publish this is to get permission from them to use these graphics. 
right? For a local class, you can kind of get away with that. But if you start publishing this, like this is their uh, ADS transport layer. This is really important in how EtherCAT works and everything. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk a little bit about the abbreviations that they'll see, right? They're gonna see that ADS and they may be curious about what it is. Talk about the product classes, talk about the licensing. So this is a illustration here of the licensing levels uh, you pay more based on the capability of your controller, the number of cores, and some other things. So that's what this graphic comes from. This is performance classes, and this is what they're going to charge you for. Uh, and they're also going to charge you if you just want to run it even on your own laptop. You're going to have to buy a permanent license if you wanted to run it permanently. Otherwise, you can run it for seven days for free. And then you can ret uh, renew that license as many times as you want to, uh, which is nice. So it'll run on your laptop. Um, here's all the requirements. You need at least Windows 7, Service Pack 1, or Windows 10. I think some of the older stuff obviously ran on probably even Windows 98 and ME and XP and all those. But the new stuff, TwinCat 3, I think it's going to take at least Windows 7, uh, which is the XAE, which is the engineering package. The hardware of your computer, you got to have at least that. Then the runtime, you got to have at least these requirements. If you're running both on the same laptop, you got to have both. So explain all that. You can see here, one of the things about uh, books, right? There is a lot of writing. And one of my experiences has been maintenance guys don't really want to read a lot. As a matter of fact, they want to, uh, they want examples. They want uh, maybe some PowerPoints. And they don't want to sit down for a real long period of time. So I got to get people up and, and doing various different things. So this is to go back through later. Uh, you know, and then simple exercises. Exercise one, the name of the software. What is it? Uh, it's installed, installed as an extension of Microsoft blank blank, right? It's Visual Studio. That's all it is. Uh, and then the abbreviations for the software. Because they will say XAE and XAR and they'll wonder what it is. A lot of particulars here about setup. Uh, you have to run this, and it, if you don't run it, I think it does, it'll error out and tell you to go run it, uh, but you got to go find it. So you got to go to TwinCat 3.1 system and run this little uh, batch file one time at the very beginning, only when you install it. Then I go through Remote Manager, and in my uh, formal write-up, I had a lot more on Remote Manager. Like I said, I had so many tr uh, problems with it. Uh, I ran 4020. Right, so that's what this is. I said the 9020 controller in this is 4020, so that version needs to be downloaded. And I left out all the problems that I had in it. And then talk about the little thing down in the service tray. Uh, this is a little more complicated than some maintenance folks want to go through. Um, but then exercise two is just start a project. Pretty straightforward, name it such and such. Then I go through communications, and then I flip them back to uh, my other book right, this book, and I have whole sections in here on uh, communications. So I have lots of stuff on Ethernet and class A through C networks, et cetera, um, somewhere in here. So this is very, this is a basic book, and then this is extending all that information here. Uh, setting up routes, which is communication, that will be very important. Uh, going through some of the Ethernet adapters and things. And this, uh, this is what I meant about needing other software to get up and set the ports up. This was, I had to use remote desktop for this. Or you can plug a monitor and a mouse right into the front of the controller. And so I also did that and probably will do it in the class. Just plug a monitor in and show up. You can see the desktop. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I have a question here. To your knowledge, Frank, is there an incentive to run a system on a Beckhoff IPC versus third-party IPCs? Licensing, configuration, et cetera. Yes, uh, there are a couple of incentives. One, they, they strongly recommend, of course, that you buy their stuff. Um, they say they're not responsible if it doesn't run right on the other stuff, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? And then they also do go through and disable you from running certain things. So you need to configure your uh, computer in a very specific way if you're going to run it. Now, what I've heard from Joe Caccini, he said, uh, actually, he's gotten it to run pretty well on his machine. 
but uh, I think when he explored what the license would cost, they, uh, if you go back here to the licensing platforms I had, let's see if it pops up. Yeah, here. Uh, if you buy a, uh, right, I think it's here, PB80, P80, very high performance. They're going to charge you at least that, right? Because they don't know what kind of computer you're running it on it. So you can't buy these cheap things. You can't buy the license for these P10, P20, P30, low capability, even if you have a low capability application. Let's say you, you're just using an old tower PC and you want to run it uh, just for a simple application. They're not going to let you buy that. They're going to charge you at least this core i7 price. So, uh, so they're discouraging you in every way. But in reality, if you know what you're doing with computers, like I, like I said, think of this more as a computer than a PLC. Uh, I think you could take anything and run run back off, you know, TwinCat on it. Uh, Gary may know more about that because he runs other CodeAssist uh, applications, right? So you can buy Wago and you can buy other things that will run CodeAssist on it. Uh, as far as I know, you know, Raspberry Pi will run CodeAssist on it. Uh, there's some stuff that uh, that will run on that. Uh, so I, I think the the cost of the license here is probably more than the cost of the PC, a lot more. <laughs> That's my guess, if you're buying the license from them. So uh, on the low end, if you bought this ARM Cortex processor, you know, this may be a few hundred bucks and maybe it comes with a license on it. But I'm not sure you can get into a back off PLC for much less than say seven hundred dollars. Uh, that I got what I thought was about the cheapest one, and I, I want to say it's six or seven hundred bucks just for the processor, uh, and it's tiny like this one down here. Uh, okay, EtherCat. So lots of stuff in there. Uh, went through a lot of the hardware, and like I said, I'm actually going to pass around, uh, you know, the bus coupler that I have with the coffee spilled in it. And it is actually taken apart. So you can take the back off and the sides and see how it clips to the DIN rail. Uh, stick a screwdriver in there and, uh, and right, check the wiring and all this. And I put a little diagram for that in there, cage clamps. It's actually pretty easy to wire with these. I used to not like these. Uh, one reason was, you know, depending on the gauge of wire, uh, I didn't use a lot of ferrules sometimes uh, in the 90s when I was wiring. So when cage clamps first came out, used to break wires and things like that. But now I use ferrules on pretty much everything. So uh, they work really well, right, with these back off, uh, these back off modules. I use these for that. Uh, what else did I have? Oh, so scanning IO, this is really important. Uh, this is connect up to the controller and pull all the terminals in automatically. And there's that diagram that I showed you before that it's a really tiny thing in here, but I actually created that, like I said, using PowerPoint. I just uh, blew it up real big, then copied it and shrunk it down uh, here in the document. So that's how I create those graphics. A lot of these graphics are just, you know, cut and paste, copy and paste straight from the, uh, the Beckhoff website. So go through a lot of hardware because they, uh, maintenance guys are going to want to know about that. I don't even know what kind of equipment they have. Uh, programming the project, right? I talk about the uh, companion book. And I say, let's go through uh, some of the basics of PLC programming. What is a timer? What are bits? You know, how do bits become numbers? All that basic stuff. What is a counter? And then start getting into specifically how to do things in, right, TwinCat. And you can see here right early on, uh, I'm, I'm having to explain how structured text works. That's just, that's not going to be a, uh, right, a module like this, like you would have in ladder logic. It will be text like this. And then I took the equivalent and I, I say this particular function, this is the way it would be used if you were to call it in ladder. You could call it for here's temperature sensor one, uh, convert centigrade into right, and then moves a value into a Fahrenheit value. So internally, it is creating something called Fahrenheit uh, sent to, right, 
sent to Fahrenheit. I created this really quick just to show what a function would look like. And then I go into a lot more detail on function blocks. Uh, explain what interfaces are. This is again, the more complex stuff here, adding actions, methods, properties, transitions, procedures, explaining what, for those who, um, who know what this stuff is. I have another, Evan says, a few months ago, I got a quote from the East Region Office of Beckoff USA for a six, 7,000 embedded PC with an ARM prop Cortex M7 for 317 bucks. Wow, I hope they were uh, not just giving you a really good deal. Uh, they gave me a 15% discount, but it cost me a thousand bucks to get that, uh, uh, the, the controller that I showed you before. Um, and maybe it has a little more capability, but uh, wow, that's a good price. So a six, 7,000 embedded PC with a Cortex M7, 317, that's a good price. So they do have a low end, according to Evan, and he has put a link up here for those of you who are on the chat. That is awesome. Um, yeah, embedded. And so, yeah, I, I may get one of those. 317 bucks is pretty friendly there. So this is, uh, this is one of the things that I found. Their training classes are very good, um, right? They, they have a very good object-oriented uh, course, and they have you build this. So I built this in my 9020, uh, going through the course, the object oriented programming course, and then I just took screenshots of it. And they related this to shapes, right? So they said, uh, there is a class just called shapes, and you can inherit things from different classes. And this shows what they are and have you do length and width, but then they, uh, they say, well, a rectangular prism, right, three dimensional, uh, rectangle has an additional uh, dimension on it. And then if you were to do a sphere, I think, I don't know if the sphere is in here uh, or a circle, and I don't see it in here, but then it would add different properties, right? It would, so you learn a lot about all these inheritance things. And then I kind of blew the icons up as big as I could using the method I mentioned before. I copied these straight from the software and then blew them up in in uh, PowerPoint and then did a snip. So for those of you who do course creation, write books, et cetera, that is a method of doing it. It's worked pretty well for me. Another exercise, you know, simple. What does POU stand for? What are the different types of POU, right? Functions, programs, and function blocks. Uh, global variable lists, have them create some global variable lists and link them to IO. So that's gonna be the very last thing they do with the actual hardware. And then I don't have enough hardware for everybody. So they're going to use their PC to do their programming after that. So I show them how to uh, attach to things and all that good stuff. Activating configuration, what does that do? So compiling, um, building the solution, et cetera explain what that is, show what all little icons meet, uh, mean, right? And some of the pop-up screens, and they'll get to see these as they do it. And then editing and transferring, really in a lot of ways, this is similar to Siemens. Uh, when you do your editing and you log in with your online change, it's not like Alan Bradley, where you uh, used to accept edits, test edits and assemble edits or finalize everything. You just log in with the change. It makes the change. And if it's not too severe of a change, it will do it without stopping your processor, which is good. So you can kind of online edit with Beckoff. That's useful. Then another exercise. Uh, these are scanned points. Uh, let's see. Using the program, create a GVL for the push buttons on your assigned trainer. And the only two trainers I did here are the 6015 and the 9020. And so... Uh, these are the hardware, right? This is what it's attached to in the hardware. And I say, name your tags, these things, because that's what they're attached to. And this, this is kind of a funny thing here, but this, uh, let's see the, yeah, this one, you notice that the push button one through four are on the second terminal. And the reason for this is those little models that I showed you, the Fisher techniques, they have more I.O. than my push button box. So to be able to use uh, those controllers, I actually pass the power on these four terminals. 
So there's a relay in there that you have to plug in to be able to use the push button box. It uh, switches four sets of contacts to the push buttons instead of switching to the power. So that's a kind of a, a strange thing I had to go and do at the last minute. And I fully intended to run um, these. Let's see. I fully intended to be able to run this guy, <laughs> right? These are uh, things that I've built before and just, you know, it's fun because you can set something down at this photo eye and run the part down here and then you'll activate this little thing and it'll do a pressing operation, come back up. So I kind of build these as little uh, training models and I fully intended to use that for the class, simply not never got around to it. So um, unfortunately that's the way that works. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's my exports and back to the Word document. Nope, not the Word document. Where am I at here? There we go. That's where I was at in the manual. So exercises, some programming. I have them do a little bit of ladder, right? That's what the ladder looks like in back off. And then I very quickly, uh, after doing this in ladder, have to flip them over to structured text. So I go through structured text here. Uh, I actually got some of this information from a book I have uh, from a guy in Denmark. He wrote a pretty good little book on structured text. And I have a feeling he used Beckoff uh, or he used Codesys uh, in his book. Uh, let's see, what was his name? Let's see if I've got his book. Somewhere here. Uh, oh, actually, it's at Automation NTH. Uh, it's called something structured text programming, and I forget the guy's name. Uh, very good guy, though. I bought his book, and we kind of had a back and forth about the strengths of ladder versus structured text. You'll never persuade, uh, right, uh, a big ladder user that structured text is better, and you'll never persuade a structured text user that, that it's better. But the one thing I will say, if you're doing Alan Bradley, you got to pay more for the structured text, and most people program in ladder. And they have elaborate functions and add-on instructions and things. That's why people in the U.S. don't like structured text. It's because they're just used to ladder. But I don't, I don't hate it. Um, you know, it's like Siemens. I do a lot of statement lists, and I don't hate it at all. Um, I'm getting better at structured text. I'm not a natural typist, so I do a lot of copying and pasting. And uh, I met a young guy yesterday. Actually, well, I've known him for a while, but. Uh, he said, you know, that's all any programmer does is a copy and paste and edit. Uh, they're not necessarily blazing typists either. So I did mention here the disadvantages. Inexperienced technicians may have difficulty debugging code, and some smaller PLCs don't allow structured text. It's not a graphical language, so finding problems can be difficult. So I mentioned that, but then I start going through if, then, and uh, else statements, case statements, uh, kind of built some stuff in here. I used examples out of, uh, uh, you know, what Beckoff had, but I kind of modified them uh, in case I ever need to, like I made use my own faults here, uh, my own fault displays to pop up messages and things like that. So I use that as an example there, but then I used the case statement they had in the book and I just kind of reword, reworded it. And I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, structure of names and things because they like bools to start with a B. They like integers to start with an N. Uh, but the the uh, I guess the templates in the United States don't always do that. So you're going to see a lot of things that are more like this, right? It'll just say red light, uh, and it may be an output. It may even say lowercase O red light, or it may say. Uh, um, H-I-N-D, right, for HMI indicator. And so there are different protocols, different places. But uh, Beckoff, in most cases, uses this standard, right? Integer, they would put a lowercase r for a real, for instance. Then I have them do some, uh, right, some exercises in here. Uh, type this in. These are the faults that I created in my own uh, projects. I had some e-stop faults, MCR faults, be able to reset the faults, right? Uh, put some uh, comments in here and all this. Don't forget to call the program. Uh, that's something people forget to do all the time. Then I get into the visualizations. So this is fun. This is one of the things I like best about Beckoff. You can make your own little HMIs. This was my, this is the one they'll create. So manual and auto, 
And then there's an auto cycle start. You push it for three seconds, it beeps, uh, you know, and you can do a cycle stop and all that. So I use this for a lot of my classes uh, in ladder and structured text, doesn't matter. Uh, this is some of the property configuration for visualizations. And then go into libraries, uh, give some examples of bringing some things up, start timing. I don't even remember what this is. Oh, this was data acquisition, right? So this is uh, uh, creating a retentive on delay timer in, in function block and then embedding the retentive on delay timer in a data acquisition block. So I have them import. I do not have them type all this in because they're not going to appreciate having to type everything. Uh, a lot of maintenance guys are not typists, so I'm not expecting them to be. So uh, then I go into data user types, and I mentioned that UDTs are what we call them in my other book, and they call them generically structures, and they refer them to uh, as DUTs. So close enough, right? Uh, data user types. Um, then have them do another exercise, have them create a data acquisition screen, et cetera. Then go into troubleshooting. This is from my other book, um, right? A lot of different methods of troubleshooting. Where can you get information from catalogs, et cetera, troubleshooting concepts, go through a lot of the classical methods of flow charts, a half split method, root cause analysis, right? The five whys, you may have heard of some of these. Ishikawa or Fishikawa diagrams. I cover this. Intermittent multiple sy systems. We have to talk about a lot of this because that's what they're there for. It's really for troubleshooting. Uh, and then cross-reference. So I have them go through and cross-reference some of their own stuff. And I believe that is the last. No, it's not. I did scopes at the very end, right? I did mention measurements and scopes. And I have them create a simple scope. And this was just me pushing a button and picking up the button pushes. This is an example of the little uh, oscilloscope that I mentioned before. And then references, all right? Beckhoff information system. And then a lot of the references are my own books, which I pulled into this. So that's really it, guys. Uh, any questions, comments? We've gotten a few comments here. Uh, thank you very much, Evan, for the lead on that part. Uh, we may actually, uh, that, that's a Scott uh, uh, tip here, the CX-7000 for 317 bucks is a good deal. Uh, anything that we can pick up that, that actually just runs, that's pretty awesome. Uh, questions, comments? I'd like to thank everybody that did show up today uh, for, for hanging out. Look like we got uh, quite a few people participating here. And uh, Gary Pratt, uh, for those of you who don't know him, he wrote a book called The Book of Codices, I believe is the title of it. And it has, it is a big, thick thing. Uh, we talked about this, I think, years ago, but I haven't actually gotten a copy of it yet. I need to get one at some point because uh, it really has probably lots deeper than I want to go on structure text, right? I'm a, I'm a beginner at this. I am not an expert at Beckhoff. Like I said, I just started learning this back in the spring uh, and have now written my first course on it. And I'm about to teach the first course uh, next week. So starting Monday, I had to get this done. I had planned to use these, as I mentioned. These, This was my timeline. So the initiative started in April and that's about when I started learning it. Uh, had the webinar this summer on hardware, got a customer in November and have a course here this month, starting Monday. So that's why I had to create all this fun stuff. Uh, that's where it came from. Uh, Evan, thank you. Um, Scott, thanks. Uh, the next webinar. So the next webinar will be January 7th. I'm not exactly sure what the topic is going to be. Oh, yes. Twin Controls by Ilias Kure. Uh, Evan mentioned that. Uh, Ilias, uh, yeah, it's called Twin Controls, and it was called something else. It was called uh, Twin Cat Help or unofficial Twin Cat Help form something, but he changed it. Uh, it's a really good, uh, really good. Oh, we have here. Oh, there we go. So, Shelly, yeah, thank you for putting on the class. I'm a maintenance guy that works mostly with Alan Bradley. 
It's exactly what I've got coming in. Uh, they know Alan Bradley and Siemens, and they're about to learn uh, back off for the first time. So we'll see, you know, what parts they, they have a hard time with. I'm going to get that experience myself, and we'll find out what people like and don't like about all this stuff. Uh, but that's really it. Uh, next webinar uh, will be uh, January 7th, and it's probably going to be pretty informal, you know, beginning of the year. Hey, what did you do last year? Uh, that kind of stuff. Courtney, hello. Thank you for putting this on. Uh, and you'll be able to watch this on YouTube, right? I always uh, uh, put these on YouTube when I'm done. I uh, should have it up by Sunday. Uh, oh, Shelly, Matthew Klein, my wife, set up Zoom on my laptop. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, great. Thanks for showing up. Yep. Uh, he's a member of the Automation Academy. So um, next webinar will be January 7th. Uh, if you have a hankering to do so, check out the Automation Academy. Uh, you know, you have to pay to join that, but IO Central is free. Uh, so thanks uh, for those of you who are members of the Automation Academy and uh, come hang out at IO Central and hopefully I will be able to stop people from sending you spammy emails. Um, I know some people got a letter from some lady uh, named Emily and uh, <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing. But uh, thank you very much for showing up and we'll see you all later.